America absolutely dominated the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, winning nearly double the amount of gold medals than the second most country. But looking back, what was maybe more important was a subtle but powerful message during a medal ceremony where two black Americans raised their fists in protest. For this, they were thrown out of the Olympic Village, shamed by many, but succeeded in raising awareness of the problems facing black America. But what caused these two athletes to raise their fists and protest and what did it symbolize? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer and this is History for Humans. This is one of the most famous pictures in Olympic history, not of athletes in actual competition. In it are three athletes, all of whom who are actually involved in the protest. Peter Norman, the Australian silver medalist, Tommy Smith, the gold medalist on top, and John Carlos with the bronze. Carlos and Smith both have their hands raised while America's national anthem was being played. And there's actually much more symbolism here than first meets the eye. But lest we go any further, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, what caused these two athletes to raise their fists in protest? And how did black power change the civil rights movement? So really try to focus your attention on answering that as we go through the story. But first, umbrellas out because I got some history to rain upon you. So from the first three videos, you know that the civil rights movement had been going on for years and that it was achieving significant victories in law, in the courts, and maybe most importantly, in the minds of many Americans. Then in 1966, after the Voting Rights Act was passed, the movement shifted from the peaceful nonviolent demonstrations that were mostly in the South as it swung North and grew increasingly radical and more adamant in demanding immediate economic and equal rights. In 1966, James Meredith was completing a march against fear from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. And when he was almost complete, he was shot by white racists. And after visiting him in the hospital, Stokely Carmichael, the leader of SNCC, decided with others that they would finish the march for him. And on the march, they experienced racist insults, attacks, and all the while, the police just looked the other way. And it became clear to Carmichael that despite a decade of protests and supposedly landmark victories, not much had changed. At a rally later that day, Carmichael ushered a phrase that took the whole movement in a new direction, stating, we have been saying freedom for six years. What we are gonna start saying now is black power. We want black power. And those words seemed to capture just what was on the minds of so many who demanded more radical action. Black power was the new anthem of the civil rights movement. Now, while still many followed Martin Luther King's movement of nonviolent resistance, the energy and trajectory had clearly shifted. And Carmichael himself really embodies this whole change. At first, he was committed to nonviolent resistance. He joined Corps and was arrested during the Freedom Rides, registered thousands of disenfranchised black voters during Freedom Summer and the Voting Education Project. Under his leadership, SNCC transformed and they no longer adhered to nonviolence, which was a bit awkward since it was in their name originally. And they began to embrace Malcolm X's any means necessary approach, as well as his ideas of black nationalism and black separatism. SNCC even removed all their white members to ensure that it was led and run by black leaders and members. Black power preached pride in their African heritage and rejected assimilating into white culture. Black is beautiful was a slogan and many youths proudly wore natural afros and donned the African colors of red, green, and black. And though gold and silver were their goals, it was black power that was on the minds of Tommy Smith and John Carlos as they headed into the 1968 Olympics. The protest during the ceremony actually began before the Olympics even started. It was 1968, a turbulent year in America and across the globe. Leading up to the Olympics, Carlos and Smith worked with the Olympic Project for Human Rights that was largely a black movement from many different countries. 
They had many demands that were in support of black athletes and trying to end black suffering and oppression around the world. They had even debated boycotting the Olympics altogether, but Carlos and Smith realized that they could make greater change and bring greater awareness by participating, dominating, and then using their achievements to highlight injustice in America and express their solidarity with the black power movement. In the Olympic Games, America was cleaning house across the board. In the end, America won 45 gold medals, and the Soviet Union, our main competitor, was second with just 29. And that brings us to... Dad Jokes in History! Why were John Carlos and Tommy Smith expected to win the gold and silver medals in the 200 meter? Bring it on. Because they were the running favorites. Get it? Running? Favorites? If you think you got a better one, I'd like to see it below. When the starting gun fired, Smith and Carlos took off as expected. Smith took first, setting a world record of 19.83 seconds, but the Australian Peter Norman out of nowhere shocked the world with a second place finish, edging Carlos by four tenths of a second. As shocking as his finish was, maybe more shocking would be his role in the protest at the podium and the severe consequences that ended his career. And that is because to many people, black power represented a serious threat to mainstream culture. And that was most visible in the rise of the Black Panthers. Wakanda fans, I'm sorry to say that this is not that Black Panther, though Stan Lee was motivated by this group when he created his Black Panther character. So let's learn about them. In 1966, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, later shortened to the Black Panther Party or just the Black Panthers. And their main mission was to protect their neighborhoods from the police. Believing that the police acted more as an occupying army that brutalized the black community, the Panthers started to patrol Oakland and police the police. At the time in California, gun laws allowed for carrying weapons in public for self-defense, and the Panthers took to exercising their rights. They shocked the country when they brandished shotguns, rifles, and pistols in public, dressed in black pants, black leather jackets, and black berets. They took on the role of a military unit with public drills and marches. They would listen to police calls on their radios and then head out to beat them to the scene and inform the people of their rights and monitor the situation with their guns in hand. But the Panthers did more than just police the streets. They also provided free breakfast to the poor children of their neighborhoods and had clinics to provide health care and education. They had a 10-point program of demands that included some basic things like freedom for black Americans, but also full employment and housing for black people and releasing all black prisoners from jail and exemption from military service. This shows how much further the black power movement went than the early civil rights leaders who were just pushing for desegregation and things like the right to vote. Stokely Carmichael later joined the Panthers and SNCC fell apart, as would the Black Panther Party in the years to come. The head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, stated the Black Panther Party without question represents the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. The FBI had a program, COINTELPRO, to destroy the organization. They would monitor, harass, and then play on internal rivalries between members, which ultimately led the group to dissolve in 1982. And this shady FBI program, COINTELPRO, didn't just target the Panthers. They were also surveilling Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and many others. Another major event that is often attributed to the rise of black power and the growing militancy of the movement were the riots in northern cities, especially the Watts Riot in Los Angeles. It was a week of looting, burning, and destruction of property in the black neighborhoods, with chants of burn, baby, burn echoing throughout. It left almost three dozen dead, almost all of whom were African American. Watts might have been a powder keg ready to explode. It had many of the necessary ingredients, high unemployment, poor schools, only one third of the people were graduating from high school and they had little opportunities. And to many, the police were seen as part of the problem. Other cities with similarly grim statistics witnessed horrific riots as well. Detroit was set ablaze that left 40 people dead. Newark, New Jersey saw cities shaking riots that took 25 lives, again, mostly black people. And demands from black power groups were aimed at addressing a lot of these underlying issues that exploded in riots. 
Then the worst riots swept the nation in 1968 after Martin Luther King was assassinated and just months later, Smith and Carlos decided to make a statement of their own on the only platform they had. After the race, Smith and Carlos agreed that they would risk severe backlash from their fans, fellow Olympians, and Americans back home in order to raise awareness of issues facing Black America and stand in solidarity with the controversial Black Power movement. And at the time, Australia was undergoing racial tensions of their own, and Peter Norman wanted to do something as well to stand for justice and equality. Talking with the Americans, he agreed to support them and to wear a badge for human rights. The three took to the podium, accepted their medals, and when the Star Spangled Banner was playing, the two Americans raised a black gloved fist to symbolize black power and strength. They both also went without shoes and wore black socks to represent poverty in black communities. Carlos wore a necklace to represent the victims of lynching. As they raised their fists, many in the crowd sneered and booed. They were ridiculed at home by the press, and two days after the ceremony, they were kicked out of Olympic Village. And I'm sure, just as their hands were earlier, their heads were held high, knowing that their stance did exactly what they hoped, raising awareness and getting people talking. And though they faced some pressure back in America, they were able to continue their careers and both actually played professional football. But Peter Norman's career was destroyed due to his quiet protest. Though he qualified for the following Olympics, setting a national record, Australia refused to send him. The raised fists and the struggle for black rights, of course, continues today. The parallels are striking. And I do hope that you see that history is indeed living through us. So let's have the good sense and the courage to look back and learn what lessons they grant us. So thanks for facing history today. This has been History for Humans. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something along the way. And if you did, could you click the thumb that looks like this and you can hit subscribe and get updates when I drop new episodes. And for teachers and homeschool parents, you can head to my website, historyforhumans.com and get lesson plans and resources that go with all of my episodes and a whole lot of other goodies there as well. And if you're doing a learning activity that you can find on my website, hang out because I got instructions in just a sec. All right, guys, got a great one for you today. You're going to get an opportunity to read an awesome primary source, the Black Panther Party's 10-point program. Try to say that 10 times fast. And after you read, you're going to answer some comprehension questions, some digging deeper questions that will help build your critical thinking skills. And then you're going to move on to part two, where you're going to level up and apply history to your life. So you're going to get to design a protest fist with things that really matter to you. What are you willing to take a stand for and to fight for? So make it personal, make it meaningful, and have some fun while you do it. All right, I'll catch you next time.